Hello, my name is Ian Sinjin, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the latest in my series of Sinjin's Pipecasts. I should like today to talk about Christopher Clarke's 2012 book called The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914. Now it's not my intention to give a complete review of Clarke's book, but rather to share with you some of the things that I personally have learnt from reading it. Now Clarke, in his book, eschews a monocausal theory of the war and does not seek to attribute guilt, rejecting in particular the conventional narrative that tends to hold that Germany was the country chiefly responsible for the outbreak of World War I. If anything, in Clarke's rendering, Germany is perhaps the least culpable of the great states for the war, being reluctantly dragged in by the actions of others. It is not to say that Germany was not responsible the point is that in Clark's analysis, all states jointly behaved in ways that unthinkingly brought about war, hence his title, The Sleepwalkers. Each of the major players acted in ways that seemed necessary in view of their strategic interests, without probably grasping that the immensity of the war that they were to bring about would eclipse any particular goal they might have and would in the end sweep away most of the world that each of them thought individually that they were fighting for. Now we start by reviewing the historical background to the war from the perspective of each of the major players in turn. This is Clark's method and it helps us to understand the logic that led each state to believe that war, while not the best outcome, was very far from being the worst. And we begin with Serbia. Now the first thing that one encounters in this book is the restless, scheming and aggressive nationalism of Serbia. Now most of us know that the war was precipitated on the 28th of June 1914 by the assassination of the heir to the Austrian throne, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand upon a, by Serbian terrorists upon a visit to Sarajevo in Austrian controlled Bosnia. But we don't generally, I think, realise how this act was part of a systematic programme of aggressive nationalist assertion by the Serbian state. The Serbian state in question was founded in 1903 when the existing king, Alexander, and his wife, Draga, were murdered in the royal palace by dissident members of the Serbian army and their butchered bodies thrown over the balcony. A new king, Peter Karadzordovic, was installed. But from this point on, effective power within the state lay with those officers who had led the coup, most notably Dragutin Dmitrievich, more usually known as Apis. These officers were strong Serbian patriots and saw it as their destiny to unite all Serbians and all lands historically associated with Serbia in one single Serbian state and to make that state dominant within the Balkans. Having conspired to kill the king these regicide networks continue to function conspiratorially within the state, with Apis sitting at the centre of a network of spies and terrorists that would eventually come to include the Black Hand Gang, whose members were to kill the Archduke. This Serbian state fought two wars in 1912 and 1913. The first in 1912 was fought with the Balkan League states of Bulgaria, Greece and Montenegro against Turkey. And these combined powers successfully drove the Ottomans out of most of Europe, except chiefly for Constantinople. Then in 1913, Serbia fought a second war with Bulgaria over the spoils of this first war. Serbia emerged from these wars 
twice as big as it had been. This is something I think to bear in mind. The Serbian state that went to war with Austria in 1914 was only just in effect one year old and was already in the process of incorporating a very large addition to its territories. And this dramatic expansion of Serbia had profound implications for great power relations in the Balkans. First, both Bulgaria and Serbia had been patronised by their fellow Slav state Russia. But as Serbia and Bulgaria went to war in 1913, Russia had been forced to take sides, and they sided with Serbia. Russia now became much more intimately associated with this aggressive, expansionist state of Serbia in the Balkans. Second, the creation of the great Serb state was yet unfinished business, since another territory to which they laid claim, and which contained a large number of Serbs, was of course Bosnia-Herzegovina, and this was formerly part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austria had annexed uh, Bosnia in 1878, and in 1909 had formally incorporated it into its empire. Now this, it turns out, was a fatal decision, for Austria now gained a systemic Serb problem. The formal annexation of Bosnia angered the Russians and infuriated the Serbian nationalists. From this point, the Serbian conspirators were determined to break Austrian power in the Balkans and add Bosnia to Serbia. To this end, unrest and conspiracies were encouraged, and one such group called Union or Death, also known as the Black Hand Gang, was formed by Apis in Belgrade in 1911 and soon had several thousand members. In May of 1914, the Black Hand Gang sent three Bosnian Serb teenagers into Bosnia to assassinate Ferdinand on his state visit. Supplied with guns, bombs and suicide capsules, they crossed into Bosnia on the 30th of May and were, as we know, all too tragically successful in their mission. Now the Austrians saw this killing for what it was the fruit of a conspiracy laid in Belgrade to challenge Austrian power in Bosnia and the Balkans. It was for this reason that they made their aggressive demands upon Serbia in their ultimatum letter of the 23rd of July 1914, including the right to send their own security forces into Serbia to investigate the crime, demands which Serbia, proud, militarily confident, and supported by Russia, felt able to reject, and so the result was war. Thus we can say that one central element in the outbreak of the war was Serbia's aggressive determination to break Austrian power in the Balkans and add Bosnia to the territory of Serbia. Let's turn now to Austria-Hungary. A second key factor in the war was the real and perceived weakness of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austria-Hungary was a state already bedeviled by nationalist tensions, being compounded out of Germans, Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarians, Croatians, Romanians and so on. To this ethnic mix they had, add, they had in 1878 added a large number of Serbians by annexing Bosnia. Now such a large, multinational state found it hard to organise and pursue its objectives. Since 1866, a dual monarchy of Austria and Hungary had been instituted, and all the key decisions that had to be agreed by the governments of both Austria and Hungary. For such an empire to add a large number of Serbians to its territories was quite simply madness. It was Bosnia that drew Austria into the febrile politics of the Balkans, and so into conflict with Serbia and Russia. 
Now, irrespective of Austria's actual weakness, its perceived weakness was just as important in explaining the events that were to ensue. There was a widespread view in Europe that Austria was simply too riven by nationalist tensions to survive in the long run. It was rather like Turkey had been a few years before, considered to be the sick man of Europe. Serbia, Russia and France all expected to break up, and so also did many Austrians. And this led to two contradictory consequences. First, it meant that Russia and Serbia did not expect Austria to assert its interests. Rather like some old family patriarch weakened by age, they expected to sit quietly in the corner, lacking the might or right to assert itself beyond the boundary of Austria-Hungary. It certainly had no future in the Balkans. Second, it meant that Austrian policymakers feared the narrative of decay and they wanted to reverse it. They were determined to reinvigorate the Austrian Empire and assert its interests. And one way they thought to do this was through war. Were Austria to assert itself against Serbia, for example, it would rally the country, unifying it around a common enemy and eliminate the disruptive presence of Serbia upon its borders. So two rival narratives thus coexisted with potentially disastrous implications. While most powers thought that a war would dissolve the Austrian Empire, and that the Austrians would dare not embark upon it for that reason, the Austrians themselves thought that war was any way to prevent their empire from disintegrating. So in the internal politics of Austria and its relations with the other states of the region, we have a second key reason for the war. Since in 1914, it was the determination of the Austrians to avenge the killing of the heir to their throne that led them to believe that the time had come to stand up for themselves as a great power and so to declare war on Serbia. Turning now to Russia, it must be said that it's probably Russia that played the most significant part in bringing about war in August 1914. In 1905, Russia had been defeated in a Far Eastern war by Japan, and this had two relevant consequences. First, it caused Russia to redirect its expansionary ambitions from the Far East to the Southwest, to the Balkans, the Dardanelles and Constantinople. This brought Russia directly into rivalry with Austria in the Balkans and Germany in Constantinople. Initially, Russia sought to patronise both Serbia and Bulgaria. But following the War of 1912, in which Bulgaria pressed towards Russia's cherished object of Constantinople, when war broke out between Serbia and Bulgaria in 1913, Russia supported the Serbs. Russia encouraged Serbian nationalist aggression against Austria. Nikolai Hartvig, the Russian minister to Serbia, continually pushed the Serbians to pursue a strong line in the Balkans, while Russia's military attaché in Belgrade worked with Apis and helped indeed to fund the Black Hand Gang. Serbia was now, writes Clark, Russia's salient in the Balkans. And while the Russians might talk of acting on behalf of their orthodox Slavic children in the Balkans, this was really, he says, only a populist justification for a policy designed to weaken Austria-Hungary, win popularity at home and secure hegemony on the Balkan hinterland to the Turkish Straits. Russia's commitment to Serbia was driven by power politics, not by the diffuse energies of pan-Slavism. Secondly, in response to its defeat to Japan, Russia sought to strengthen its economic and military potential. 
the Russian economy grew strongly in the 10 years before the war. Its growth greatly furthered by large French loans. The result was an important contrast with Austria. While everyone, th while everyone thought that the Austrian Empire was declining and facing dissolution, observers thought that Russia was getting stronger and would in the near future become extremely strong. This perception of Russian strength shaped events as much as the perception of Austrian weakness. For with Russia expected to go from strength to strength, countries like Britain and France were ever more keen to ally with her, while it led Austria and Germany to fear Russia and believe in the long run Russia would prevail, so that if there was going to be a war, it were better for them that it be, suit, that it be fought sooner rather than later. Let's turn next to the French-Russian alliance. By the early years of the 20th century, there were two great alliances in Europe, the German-Austrian dual alliance and the Franco-Russian alliance. In terms of the origin of World War I, Clark emphasizes the importance of the Franco-Russian alliance, which came over time in effect to include Britain too. The French were very worried about German strength, and to offset this they looked to Russia, which offered of course the prospect of a two-front war against Germany. But Russia was also believed to be coming, as we said, ever stronger. This was an exaggeration. Russia was not as strong as observers believed, and the war was to reveal this. Yet at the time this was not understood. Instead, the French were determined to deepen their alliance with Russia, being worried that an emboldened and confident Russia might simply abandon France and do its own thing. Clark summarises the French security credo as follows. The alliance with Russia is our bedrock. It is the indispensable key to our military defence. It can only be maintained by intransigence in the face of demands from the opposing bloc. This thinking caused the French to lend large sums of money to Russia, which helped to fuel the very development that so intimidated the other powers. They encouraged Russia to build railway lines to their western front with Germany, so as to speed up their mobilisation for war and it led the French to give sustained support to Russia's policies in the Balkans, despite the fact that that support was fueling Serbian aggression and making war with Austria more likely, a war that would probably come to include France also. This was the so-called Balkan inception scenario. Rather than seeking to cool Russian actions in the Balkans, France in effect egged them on as a means to strengthen the alliance between the two countries. Indeed, the French thought that if there was to be a war, it would be best if it started in the Balkans, in a Russian conflict with Austria, since this would ensure that Russia would remain true to its alliance with France, and would attack Germany as the French desperately needed them to do. Turning now to Britain, in the early years of the 20th century, the British had been developing closer ties with France and Russia. Now we usually see this, and I've always considered it to be, a response to the growing threat from Germany, pushing Britain towards France and Russia in an attempt to avoid isolation. But Clark disagrees with this. He sees each of these alliances as an attempt by Britain to improve relations with the powers concerned for essentially imperial reasons. To avoid conflict with France in North Africa and Egypt, Britain gave France a free hand in Morocco in return for Britain having a free hand in Egypt. Still more important were improved relations with Russia to prevent conflict over such territories as Persia and Afghanistan. 
Like other powers, Britain exaggerated Russian strength. And in any case, the British knew that they would struggle to defend imperial interests in such far distant places like Persia, where Russia was much better geographically situated. As Sir Arthur Nicholson, the permanent undersecretary for foreign affairs, wrote in May 1914, it is absolutely essential to us to keep on the best terms with Russia, as were we to have unfriendly or even indifferent relations with Russia, we should find ourselves in great difficulties in certain localities where we are unfortunately not in a position to defend ourselves. Britain's alliance with France and Russia was intended therefore not to contain Germany but to contain France and Russia. But the effect of allying with those powers was indeed to push Britain into a more hostile position vis-a-vis -vis Germany, since that was the whole reason for the Air Alliance in the first place. This chimed with important voices within the Foreign Office, led by the Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey, who was strongly anti-German, for reasons, thinks Clark, that were fallacious, since the actual examples of Germany posing a threat to Britain were few and far between. Most notably, while Germany had been in rival with Britain in naval construction, by 1910 Britain had clearly won this arms race and the German Navy posed no threat to the British. So to restrain a power that Britain did have problems with, namely Russia, Britain made friendship with Russia to restrain a power, Germany, with which it did not have serious issues. Just as Russia's perceived strength caused France to want to ally with Russia and Germany to think that an early war would be better than a late one, so did it cause Britain to back Russia. Britain went to war in 1914 not to fight Germans or Austrians or defend Serbia, but to remain on good terms with Russia. Looking now at Germany, although Clark downplays Germany's responsibility for the war, he does acknowledge that several of Germany's actions were provocative. For example, the Kaiser's 1895 letter in support of the Boers against the British, though nothing in fact came of this, Germany's intervention in China, and Germany's protests over French actions in Morocco and of course the German naval expansion programme. Most significant was Germany's involvement in Turkey, where they moved in to fill the void left by the withdrawal of British support for the Ottoman Empire and the defeat of Turkey at the hands of the Serbians and Bulgarians in 1912. Germany invested heavily in Turkey and began building a railway line from Constantinople to Iraq which was the British saw as threatening their interests and helping to rebuild the Turkish army. Germany's involvement with Turkey greatly alarmed the Russians. Russia had for long been eyeing up Constantinople and the Straits. The last thing Russia wanted to see was a strong Turkey allied with Germany. Thus when in 1913 the Germans sent a sizeable military mission to Constantinople under Lieutenant General Lehman, with plans to have Lehman have an official command role within the Ottoman army and be responsible for all military training and to actually take control of the Turkish defence of the Straits and Constantinople. The Russians protested vehemently and threatened war. The Germans backed down and though the German military mission went ahead, Lehman was deprived of his commanding role within the Ottoman army. Underlying German policy, says Clark, was a perpetual fear of the future. Like all other powers, Germany exaggerated the strength of Russia. They saw Russia's growing population, her developing industry, and her French-backed railway lines all tending towards the German border 
as signs of an inexorably growing threat. In 1904, the combined Franco-Russian army exceeded that of Germany and Austria by 261,000 men. By 1914, this excess was one million. German leaders were convinced that their chances of winning a war against France and Russia were steadily declining. Just as France and Russia thought that time was on their side, the Germans, like the Austrians, thought that time was against them. So again, perceptions of Russian power caused both sides to look favourably upon war. The French and Russians, because they thought they would win it. The Germans and Austrians, because they thought if war was going to come, it was better that it come sooner than later. So how then did war actually come? In a way, all Europe's powers were led into the war by an understanding of history. When they extrapolated the future based upon an understanding of the past, the logic of events seemed to point towards war. The future, they thought, would see two trends. First, a steady decline and disintegration of the Austrian Empire, and a steady rise in the power of Russia. Now these were perceptions and not realities. While Austria was probably going to weaken further, Russia did not necessarily command the future, and in practice its army and economy were far weaker than they seemed. Because by the time this was discovered, the war was already underway. It's within this context that we can see how the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand led to war. The Austrians knew that Serbia was behind the assassination and they believed that they had to stand up to Serbia. Failure to do so would evaporate their remaining prestige and their empire was sure to dissolve. A war against Serbia would, if anything, strengthen Austria rallying the empire against a common enemy. So we can easily grasp why the Austrians sorry, the Austrians uh, issued a strongly worded ultimatum to Serbia and then why they declared war five days later. The problem was that they never properly considered what this war would be like. Would Austria even win a quick war against Serbia? And what if the attack drew Austria into a war with Russia? And then, quite possibly, France and Germany as well. The implication of this was simply not considered. In this way, the Austrians sleepwalked into war. Clark sums up the blinkered Austrian reasoning as follows. No sustained attention was given to the question of whether Austria-Hungary was in any position to wage a war with one or more other European great powers. The most important reason for the perplexing narrowness of the Austrian policy debate is surely that the Austrians were so convinced of the rectitude of their case and of their proposed remedy against Serbia that they could conceive of no alternative to it. The Germans were drawn in to supporting Austria. Now one reason was is they sympathised with Austria's anger and thought that the Serbs indeed needed to be punished. They too seemed to have thought that the Austrians could quickly prevail and the view in Germany was let the Austrians send threatening terms to the Serbians. The Serbians would probably back down. If they didn't, then let the Austrians strike quickly and get over with. Of course, the Germans saw the risk that Russia might come to Serbia's aid, but they considered it more likely that the Russians would also back down, since they would not to want to fight a war now over Serbia. Surely, with Russia set to get stronger in the future, they would not risk a war so soon. On the 17th of July, 1914, it was still the view in Berlin that a localisation of the conflict is expected since England is absolutely pacific and France as well as Russia likewise 
do not feel inclined towards war. But if Serbia and Russia did not back down, well so be it. Better a war now than one in a few years, when Russia's position will be relatively stronger, and the Schlieffen Plan, which envisaged Germany being able to fight and beat first France and then Russia, would no longer be feasible. Thus, the Austrian ambassador to Berlin reported on the words of the German foreign minister, Bettmann Holweg, on the 6th of July 1914. In the matter of our, Austria's, relationship with Serbia, he, Holweg, said that it was the view of the German government that we must judge what ought to be done to sort out this relationship. Whatever our decision turned out to be, we could be confident that Germany, as our ally and our friend of the monarchy, would stand behind us. I gathered that both the Chancellor and the Kaiser view an immediate intervention by us against Serbia as the best and most radical solution of our problems in the Balkans. From an international standpoint, he views the present moment as more favourable than a later one. This passage captures the essence of German thinking. A quick Austrian strike against Serbia would have German support, being the best way to solve the Serbian problem. If war did come, it would probably be localised war between Austria and Serbia. And if Russia did intervene, and Germany was therefore drawn in too, it was better war now than later. Yet it is clear too how far the Germans also were sleepwalking to disaster. They exaggerated the chances that Serbia and Russia would back down in the face of an Austrian ultimatum. Just as they exaggerated Austria's ability to launch a quick strike against Serbia. The elaborate bureaucracy and constitutional system of Austria-Hungarian Empire pretty much precluded this. It took the Austrians a full month after the assassination to actually declare war. But still the Germans stuck doggedly to the localization policy. Indeed, once the Russians began their partial mobilization against Austria on the 29th of July, the Kaiser panicked and wrote a personal message to the Tsar calling for negotiations between Austria and Russia and offering his services as a mediator. But by now it was too late. The next day, Russia moved to a general mobilisation, and then Germany had no choice but to mobilise. Although Germany's eventual mobilisation was reactive, their conduct since the assassination had helped to bring about the state of affairs where war was likely. As Clark writes, through their support for Austria-Hungary, and through their blithe confidence in the feasibility of localisation, the German leaders made their own contribution to the unfolding crisis. They made other mistakes too. They misjudged completely Austria's chances of waging a quick war against Serbia. They discounted the possibility that Belgium would resist their invasion of their territory as Germany made its way through to France. They mistakenly believed that Britain was likely to stay out of the war. And above all, like all the other powers, they showed no grasp of the immensity of the war they were about to bring about. A war in which a solution of Austria's Balkan problems would be swept away into insignificance. The French were keen to support Russia in the Balkans, believing that they were thereby solidifying the Franco-Russian alliance, which in turn underpinned their own conception of their national security. The problem with this strategy is that it linked the fate of France to the unstable politics of the Balkans. But here the French sleepwalked, because they believed the Austrians would dare not risk a war with Russia over Serbia. And even if all else failed, there were, says Clark, worse things than a war at the side of mighty Russia and the military, naval, commercial 
and industrial power of Great Britain. They assumed too that their army could repel any German attack and launched their own counter-attack into Germany. Hence on the 20th of July, the day the Austrians declared war on Serbia, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Sazanov, was visited by the French ambassador, who assured him that the Russians could count on the complete readiness of France to fulfil her obligations as an ally. This French assurance, says Clark, was one factor in the Russian decision to begin to mobilise their troops the next day. France, in other words, was quite ready to countenance a general European war over the Austro-Serbian Balkan crisis, and in this too they were sleepwalking, since France's exaggeration of Russian strength and their underestimation of the Germans was to bring France itself to the brink of defeat and leave millions of its own citizens dead. But the Russians also sleepwalked. Since 1913, they had swung their support behind Serbia in the Balkans and their minister in Belgrade urged the Serbians to pursue an aggressive line of conduct towards the apparently enfeebled Austria. The Russians had no wish to see Serbia accede to Austria's ultimatum, since the result would be to make Serbia in effect a subordinate state of Austria. As, as, the, as the Russian foreign minister remarked, as Russia formulated its response to the Austrian ultimatum to the Serbs, for Russia to stand back now from its historic mission to secure the independence of the Slavic peoples would be to reduce it to the rank of a second-rate power and forfeit its prestige in the Balkans. With the French as their allies and the British too, the Russians had no fear of a war with Austria and they seemed to believe first that in response to Russia's support for Serbia, Austria would back down and second, if war was to go ahead, it would be possible for Russia to mobilise its army in the southwest and fight a limited war with Austria thereby keeping the Germans out. Hence they encouraged a wavering Serbia to stand firm against Austrian threats by informing the Serbs on the 25th of July that they were ready to mobilise their army in support. It was this that caused the Serbians to reject the Austrian demands and which provoked Austria into declaring war on the 28th of July. Russia announced a partial mobilisation of its army against Austria but not against Germany the next day. Russia's immediate motive, then, was to rally behind Serbia, partly to advance their position as the leader of the Slavic people and also to eclipse any claim Austria might have to exert authority in the Balkans. But according to Clark, the Russians had another motive, to use a Balkan war to break the power of Turkey and gain control of the Straits separating the Black Sea from the Mediterranean. War, if it came, appeared to offer only benefits to Russia and hence they were ready to begin mobilising their army. Yet Russia's leaders had made a key mistake. It simply was not possible to mobilise their army in the region only of Austria. Their mobilisation plans had been drawn up in the anticipation of a war with Germany. Any attempt to mobilise only in the area around Galicia and Ukraine would wreck their wider mobilisation required for potential war with Germany. Hence, despite ordering only a partial mobilisation against Austria on the 29th of July, the next day the Tsar was forced to change this to a general mobilisation under pressure from his army high command. The Russians thereby became the first power to order a general mobilisation. It was, says Clark, one of, the one of the most momentous decisions of the July crisis. At this point the Germans were yet to begin any mobilisation at all, but now they also began their own mobilisation. Quite simply, it was the Russian general mobilisation of 30th of July that made war pretty much inevitable, 
since once the Russians were mobilising along their border with Germany, they could invade and derail any German war plans, since Germany will be then facing a defensive war against Russia and France, and this they assumed they could not win. So if Russia mobilised, Germany had to as well. And then the logic of the Schlieffen plan was that Germany had to invade France. The Germans began mobilising on the 31st of July and sent an ultimatum to Russia that unless its own mobilisation was stopped, then Germany would declare war. When Russia refused, Germany declared war on Russia on the 1st of August. Thus the Russians, while intending to mobilise against Austria, ended up mobilising against Germany as well. And within two days, a European war had begun. Russia had hoped to fight a war against Austria, which they were confident of winning, but now they faced a war against Germany and Austria, and these combined forces were simply to prove too strong for Russia, bringing social unrest, defeat, and of course ultimately the destruction of the Tsarist Empire. Britain's entry into the war was more fatalistic than that of the other powers. The British government had no love for Serbia and no interest in the Balkans conflict. The British didn't judge a war worth a worthwhile option in the way that the other powers all did. But the British were prisoners of their thinking just the same, and in this too they also were sleepwalkers. The British Foreign Office had cultivated an anti-German attitude, and the membership of the Triple Entente with Russia and France had encouraged this bias within their thinking. What this meant by 1914 was that the tendency of British policy pointed towards joining with France and Russia against Germany. The alternative being seen to be a possible German victory, which was assuredly against British interests. Ayer Crow of the Foreign Office expounded this argument forcibly on the 25th of July. Whatever we may think of the merits of the Austrian charges against Serbia, France and Russia consider that these are pretexts, and that the big and that the bigger cause of the Triple Alliance against the Triple Entente is definitely engaged. Our interests are tied up with those of France and Russia in this struggle which is not for the possession of the Serbia, but one between Germany aiming at a political dictatorship in Europe and the powers who desire to retain individual freedom. Crow's narrative attributes responsibility for the looming war to Germany. Clark, of course, rejects this. But what is important is that it was such arguments that helped to form British policy in the last crucial day before her own entry into the war. The war was a test of strength between Germany and France and Russia, and Britain's interest lay with France and Russia. However, Clark again believes that it was not it was Russia and not Germany that shaped British policy. British governments believe that the main threat to the country's imperial interests came from Russia, and this led them to seek to ally with Russia and France. Once having made this decision, the options for free action greatly diminished. First, having developed defence ties with France, for example in allowing the British Navy to patrol the Channel, freeing up the French Navy for operations in the Mediterranean, they were drawn into fighting with France once the war began, because the French justifiably claimed that they had entrusted their Channel defences to Britain and there was no easy way to abandon this commitment. Second, the British remained profoundly concerned about Russia. A German victory would be bad for Britain, but so too would be a French and Russian victory without Britain. Crow again, sem uh, uh, Crow again summed up the dilemma on the 25th of July. Should the war come and England stand aside, one of two things must happen. A. Either Germany and Austria win, crush France and humiliate Russia. What will be the position of a friendless Britain?
B of France and Russia win? What would then be their attitude towards England? What about India and the Mediterranean? So, if Britain stood back and Germany won, then Britain would be friendless in Europe and would face Germany on its own. But if the Russians and French won, then the British have abandoned their allies and the Russians would rip up imperial agreements with Britain and proceed to move against British interests in Persia, the Middle East and in India. The only option for Britain was to throw in its lot with France and Russia and hope to emerge on the winning side with these two powers as its friends rather than as betrayed, en as betrayed and not its betrayed enemies. Thus Britain found herself drawn into a war which was not in her immediate interests but which seemed the only feasible course to pursue. So why then did World War I occur and was any one power peculiarly to blame? The answer Clark provides is that the war happened because a series of powers took decisions which, while apparently logical, were based on mistaken assumptions and failed to grasp the immensity of the outcomes. None of the powers involved comprehended the risks that they were running. One might think of them as a group of people playing a football game on the edge of a precipice without looking down into the void. Any given move in the game made sense to each player, but the rationality of all was utterly compromised by the failure to comprehend that the cliff edge itself might give way at any moment, casting the entire game into oblivion. The Austrians saw the assassination of the edge of their throne as an existential threat to their empire. Given this, they had to be seen to standing up to Serbia. The Germans were drawn into supporting Austria believing that if they sided with Austria, Serbia and their Russian allies would back down. But if they did not back down, well, the risk was worth taking. Better a war now than one in the future, when Russia would be even stronger. The French, meanwhile, were keen to support Russia and Serbia in the Balkans, believing that they were thereby solidifying the Franco-Russian alliance. And if war did develop, then this is an acceptable outcome, since with the Russians as their allies, and most likely the British too, the French would prevail against their old German rivals. With the French firm in their support, the Russians were emboldened to encourage the Serbs to stand up to the Austrian ultimatum, believing that if war followed, Russia would break Austrian power in the Balkans and open the way for Russia to take Constantinople and dominate the Straits. And once France and Russia plumped for war, well Britain had little choice but to follow suit, since to stay on the sidelines would risk either a Europe dominated by Germany or by an embittered France and Russia. In this way every country came to believe that the war was an acceptable outcome since by its means they could expect to realise strategic goals. The problem was that none of the powers really saw the big picture. They simply didn't stop to probably consider what a mass European war fought with devastating new weapons would be like. Thus the Austrians reasoned in terms of a punitive strike against Serbia. But it was always in the nature of an emotional reaction to assert their status as a great power. They never seriously asked themselves what would be the outcome. Would they annex Serbia? change its government? Given that their occupation of lands inhabited by significant numbers of Serbs had created the crisis in the first place, it's hard to see how expanding Austria's borders deeper into Serbian lands could end anything other than badly. Neither did they consider what would happen if Russia did attack. Could Austria fight both Serbia and Russia? Surely not. Hence the need for German support. And once Germany joined the fray, France would follow, and a European war with it. How would Austria emerge from that? No one could know, and no one really even thought about it. 
Yet it was a highly likely outcome of the decision to send an aggressive ultimatum to Serbia. The whole thing was an irrational gamble, since their chain of thinking extended little more than a few weeks into the future, and there was no attempt to assess the probable payoffs. Similar reflections apply to the other powers. Was France really capable of bearing the brunt of a German offensive? Could the Germans reasonably expect to beat Russia, France and Britain combined? And what would victory or defeat even look like in a 20th century war? These were the wider contexts that were not considered in 1914. The focus was narrowly on the Balkans, when the result of any commencement of hostilities would probably be a world war. And this, none of the protagonists seriously stopped to think about. Only for a few brief hours on the 29th of July did the Russian Tsar hesitate to order a general mobilisation, saying, I will not be responsible for a monstrous slaughter. But by now, the momentum to war could not be arrested. The following day he gave way and agreed to a general mobilisation of the Russian army. Within five days fighting had begun. By the time it ended, nine million people had died and the three great empires of Austria, Russia and Germany had been destroyed, with consequences we still feel today. The outbreak of war, concludes Clark, was not a crime in the sense that no one power was responsible, but it was assuredly a tragedy. Thank you.